Uh, welcome to the Business Influencer Podcast, where we interview and explore the success stories of high profile entrepreneurs, business leaders, senior policy makers, and get insights from thought leaders around the issues of the day. My name is Ninda Jahal. I'm the co-founder of the Natural Group at the Signature Awards, and I'm the co-publisher of the magazine, The Business Influencer, and I will be your host for today. The, the guest for today is quite a remarkable lady who, um, who took on a school where all the KPIs were basically going in the wrong direction. So we had increasing number of staff turnover, falling pupil numbers, and dissent amongst the stakeholders. So here's the story of how one lady, Haminda Chana, turned round a school that everybody else had given up on. Good afternoon, Aminda. Good afternoon, uh, Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I know it's about, is it what is, two o'clock on a Friday? Interesting, I notice there's no kids around. So That's right. So if we get a chance, I'll get a, I'll get a question about uh, why that is. Um, so before we go into detail as to what we're going to chat about, let me read something out for you, if you don't mind. Of course. So this was 2014, Ofsted, uh, and it said, quote, the inspectors accused Golden Hillock, that's the school, of not keeping children safe from the risks associated with extremist views and said female staff had complained of being spoken to in an intimidating manner by the school leadership, that teaching was inadequate and that children's progress was not being, pro was not being properly monitored. Staff turnover was extremely high, with nearly two thirds of the staff being temporary and what we call supply teachers, people who come in and go out. Now, in, in a footballing sense, that's like a mid-table premiership manager taking over a side that's about to be relegated. Any manager that does that risks losing reputation, increased stress. It just doesn't make sense. So why did you, from the comforts of a, of a brilliant job or at another school, take the risk and plumb for a job that on the, pay, on the face of it looks highly, highly risky. But before you answer that question, <laughs> let's go back into your journey. Okay. Um, so what was it in your upbringing, because I know you're born locally, what was it in your upbringing that said to you, that cried out, I want to work in education? So um, it's an interest, it's an, it is an interesting journey and I think as time goes by and I think when age kicks in I think you start to reflect a lot more and I think I couldn't have articulated back then what I'm able to articulate now in terms of why I was drawn to education and I ended up um, being in the profession because actually growing up I didn't have any um, kind of want to come into the education world. I came from a very traditional family in that everybody was going to be a doctor or a lawyer. And, and, that's, and that's what I, what I grew up with. But interestingly enough, it was, my, it was my dad who actually never wanted me to go into law because he felt if you, you went down that route, you'd have to lie. It was really interesting. <laughs> his interesting. Kind, yeah, interesting. his kind of um, understanding of that. But what I did pick up growing, growing um, up was this sense of there was always more than just my parents who were looking after my upbringing. So whether that was grandparents, that, whether that was extended family, which I used to live in, growing up in Bilston, all of that a uh, long time ago, it was always this sense of you always felt safe growing up because there was more than one adult who was looking after your up build, uh, upbringing. So there's definitely something around that piece and which I think later on drew me um, to edu education and really when I think about the school mission here as well, this idea of it takes a whole community to bring up a child, it is drawn from those childhood experiences around having as many adults as possible looking after the upbringing um, of our children. So it wasn't understood at childhood, but then as we moved up, it was really by chance. And then, so if I fast forward into getting married, having my girls, and an opportunity that actually presented itself, it was actually a taste today in Birmingham. There was this big drive for science teachers. I had done A-levels at science, wasn't actually sure what I wanted to do. Um, and I went for a taste today. That's where I remember that this was going to be the profession I was going to go into. Went for a taste today, 
walked into a classroom, group of children in front of me, um, and I got to talk about cells. And that was the point at which it clicked to me, actually, in 2004, that actually this is the profession I want to come into. And, uh, you know, as kids were taught to focus on a career yeah. and have a plan. Yes. You know, by this age I want to be this, by this age I want to do this, by this age I want to do... Did you have a plan or did you just say, this is what I want to do? I think it, it, the, the plan sometimes, and I think this is about cultural growing up and upbringing, I think the plan was almost written for you by others. Okay. And actually, when you're a child going through that first phase of your life, you want to push back on anything any adult uh, wants you to do. But I think as time has gone by, I think the thing that has come out of the plan is this idea of the ability to be adaptable, be changeable. It's survival of the most adaptable, which is actually quite a key point when we're talking about the time we're going through now. But the skills around being adaptable and things changing, when we think about our own parents, first generation into the family, migrated from India to Africa and then came to the, came to the UK, and all of that change that they had to go through, Again, I think some of that rubs off. So I think a cultural plan is written, and then you're given the skill. You're given the skills of adaptability, and it's those that come into play as you move forward um, into your own life. I think. Right. So fast forward, uh, you then get into what we call school management. Yeah. Uh, and then this job came up. Yes. So you had a reasonably good management position elsewhere. This yep. job came up. So when I read you that piece from Ofsted. Yes. As I said to you, most people would run a mile. Yeah. What made you do the reverse? What made you then think, actually, this is a role I could do? So if I flip back to 2012, actually, it was a lot about what I learned from my first headship over at Nishkam High School. Very successful school, top performing um, in Birmingham. But it was a free school that was set up, and I was really lucky to be part of the initial inception of, of that programme. And I remember a lot of what I ended up bringing into Art Bolton actually came from Nishkam from the point of view of what it took in terms of having all stakeholders within the community work together to be able to give the schools, to be able to give the pupils more than just an educational provision. It was a lot more about how you look after your children so they go on to be local citizens, making sure that our next generation understand that they have got a responsibility moving forward. This piece around teachers being in local apprentice, and it's a phrase I use a lot because it was a phrase I was first introduced to in 2004, which again is a lever that pulled on me in terms of why I came into the profession. But in local apprentice, just broadly means that you take responsibility for that child whilst they're in your care, which is what we do for seven, eight hours a day as, as teachers. But actually at Nishcam, I saw all of those things happen in terms of our staff CPD, what we did for our children, and then to be able to apply that to a setting like this, it was almost as if the setting was calling out for that approach, which is why I think I was drawn to this setting. I wanted to be able to show that you could take that approach and then be able to do it somewhere else. So you were ready to take the challenge of a failing school, yeah. where most of the teachers in the room were what we call supply teachers, like subcontractors. Yeah. Um, but you were willing to take that, and, 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 and you didn't think about the risk of reputation and... So, I'll, 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 absolutely, that was on my mind. But then, then I'm thinking about a question that I always ask myself, which is, what are we actually here to do? And absolutely, you know, you, you do well in your role and you feel good. That's just like ego. You know, everybody wants to feel good about what they do. But I think I'm drawn and anchored in that question around what is it that I'm actually here to do? And we talk about, you know, you get up in the morning and what's the purpose of that day? I'm really grounded to that kind of thinking. So this was scary. It was, why would I leave? I'm in a good job. It's an outstanding school. Why would you come across? I think at that point, I realised I didn't have much more to offer. Okay. And I'm actually from, when I did my training, I was from Warsaw. It was a high levels of deprivation. So the inner city setting I was drawn to, and I actually felt that I could add more value here. And I had the tools to do it at that point. So you walk in, yeah. you've got the job. Um, the KPIs look terrible. Yeah. Um, so what's your first step? What's your, what, what did you have in your mind a plan for the first 100 days? Did you think, well, this is what I'm going to do, this is what I'm going to say? 
uh, you know, a, a school that's highly demotivated. Its yeah. staff are going through the turnstiles quicker than you can say. So, yeah. how, how did you set about providing leadership to a failing organisation where yeah. its stakeholders are involved? Uh, just give me the picture. How did you? How did you? How, how did you cope with that complexity? So it was interesting because the first hundred day plan ended up being a... Did you have a 100-day plan? So I actually did have a 100-day okay, plan. Okay, okay. It, yeah. it was a very well-scripted... It looked perfect on paper, by the way. Um, a very well-scripted 100-day plan. Um, and then when we arrived here at the start of September, we then realised we didn't have the staff that we thought we were going to have. So slightly challenging. What, they'd already left? They'd left? Or? They, they, they'd left. So actually, my first day, which was about vision and mission and statementing and doing all of that stuff ended up being pick up the phone to supply teachers and let's see who we can get in slight change of tack there but I think how you work at it Ninda I think there's there's kind of two things that come into mind I think it's being absolutely secure and connected to your why and your mission being able to articulate that with clarity and then actually giving people the route map in terms of how you're going to get there. So I always think about five years and work backwards. It's always the five year plan. I think it's really naive to say that you can think about something reactively or year on year. I think as far as possible, five year plan, then you work back. And you have to be able to stamp the milestones that you move across because you have to then be able to articulate the quick re- wins to your organisation because they won't blindly follow you and neither should they. We have to keep over communicating the purpose of what it is that we're trying to do. And you know, and that's to any organisation, education, finance, business, whatever that is. If your people are not with you because you haven't over communicated where it is that you're trying to get to, I think you'll lose them along the way. So let's go through some of the KPIs you inherited. Of course. Yeah, so you walked in. Um, so you had 869 pupils, yep. but the numbers were going down. That's right, because so, 900 is what we have yeah, as so term Yeah, so they were going down. Your progress score measured by Ofsted was below average. Yeah. Your staff retention was 32%. Yeah. 30, so you had more people here on the supply than... Yep. Um, and leave at 60, being able to access a level three course was only 82%. Yeah. So uh, 18% had nowhere to go. Uh, and by the way, uh, for those who obviously work in, in the private sector, you had a deficit, you were losing money. That's right. Which of those was the most important and how did you prioritize what to tackle first? I think with, with, with anything that you do, I always talk about this idea of having to run your high levers in parallel because they can never just be one thing to to pull an organization out of that type of problem isn't going to be a linear approach in that you do one thing at a time but i think what you've got to do is you've got to pick your two or three things just make sure you've picked the right two or three things so for us it was very much about how do we get parents and the community on board because without that nothing was moving forward and the second thing was how do we show educationalists, teachers, that when they come to Art Bolton, we still have something to offer you. Because we're asking you to come to our school, but what is it that we can offer you? So I think those two things in parallel around what we did with our parents and our community, but what we were able to give to our staff was absolutely key. And that's where the network absolutely, um, I must mention, in terms of the art network was was amazing. Yeah, we'll, we'll, co- we'll come to when you yeah. work with peers. Yeah. Oh, okay, so you take, no, so, so you walked in. Now, just again, give a bit of a sense of the problem. Uh, you'd had three brand changes. In other words, yes. you changed the name of the school three times. Yep. Within, within three to four years? Three to four years, yeah. Three to four years. Been. You'd had three headmasters before you'd That's come right. within three to four years. So it's like the chief exec being changed every year. Yep. <laughs> they used to in football, but not a chief, a chief exec level. No. no. Um, Imagine your organisation changing its name three or four years I and mean, some of the stress around that. Yeah. Now, what was interesting, of course, if you can take it one step further, the kids have to keep changing their uniform. That's a, that's that's a, right. bit, of, that's a bit of a nightmare. So you, your basic kids don't know what, what's going on. So when you walked in, did you get a sense of we've been here before? Oh, absolutely. And human nature is as such that it defaults to what it's already seen so it was really hard because we weren't having to do undo a problem that had happened once we were having to almost undo a problem that had happened three times and i think that that was really challenging and this is where actually the consistency and the commitment of an individual i think is really key 
I think when you step into a role like this, you've already come in with the mindset that you're going to see the job through. And I think there's great responsibility when you take on, on a role like this or in any organisation that isn't where it needs to be. It's not about a year. It's not about the quick win. It's not about getting to the end of 12 months and highlighting we've done this. It's about actually the longevity of what you're going to pass on also. And sometimes that's not factored into the thinking of organisational change. So what's my legacy when I leave? My legacy is that we leave a school that is in a stronger position than what I picked up. We offer our community an outstanding provision of education that they've not had before and that the incoming leader isn't spending their first 100, 100 days undoing in a mess. What they're doing is absorbing what's happened and thinking how they're going to use that as a springboard to move forward. Were there any dark moments? Plenty, plenty. And I think the dark moments, I think the thing, are the thing that actually pull you towards, connect you back to your why in terms of that's the point at which you then have to pull upon why did I decide to come here? And sometimes as leaders, we don't, we don't re-engage with that enough. We don't reflect enough. Um, so there are plenty of dark days, you know. It gets dark in October, the teachers still haven't come through. There's a national shortage of teachers. Um, and, you know, you feel it for the kids. It's that tension, isn't it, between how do you get the right people in quick enough to be able to, to serve the kids in the right way. So plen plenty of dark moments, but I think that's the bit point at which you've got to reconnect with your why and why you do it. Resilience is absolutely key, absolutely key. They say um, if you get the attention to detail right, then the overall picture sorts itself out. Yeah. So, so is it true that I read somewhere that you even had conversations with your various stakeholders over the colour and the fabric of a shoe? Yeah, I did. And why was that important? The devil, the, the devil is always in the detail. And this goes back to this idea of being able to talk with clarity about where you want to get to and always talk about five years and back. So this idea of the shoes, I know that I need my kids to look smart. And the reason that the shoe colour mattered to me was because when I talk about we will love your children as if they were our own, there was nowhere that I would let my girls walk out of the house without the correct uniform or the shoe colour. And so when parents started to see that, and a lot of this is silent consistency with your parents, because when you're, when you're talking to parents about shoes, they're taking a step back and saying, well, why would somebody else talk to my child about shoes? And then they finally understand it's because we care. It's because we will hold them to the same standards that you'd hold your own children. And that's why that was a key market. That was really important to do. And so somebody, um, somebody said, it was quite interesting. Somebody said, evolution may have seemed chaotic. And I think you've seen the thing. Chaotic, yeah. Yeah, and it might have even been random but nothing was accidental, everything was planned. It's back to the word planned again. Yeah. So you had an overarching strategy, a five year strategy that you were, and then the detail just filled itself in. Absolutely, so whether you're a CEO, an exec, whatever your role is, the responsibility that you hold to your organization is to make sure that you've got that plan and you, that plan is clear, but that plan has enough flex in it. So when things that come up that you haven't thought about, the plan can absorb that change and I think that's not that's not done as much as it should be but your plan having flex so it can withstand whether that's a financial meltdown whether that's a covid situation whether that's a sudden change in management or KPIs of changing because of something economic happening if your plan is unable to withstand that then you've got to think about actually what stress test did your plan go through in the first place and um now, it's interesting, um, there's a lot of debate around in schools and education, and gen actually, generally in public life, about zero tolerance. Yes. Uh, and we hear about that word, zero yeah. tolerance, but you reject it. You reject zero tolerance, and maybe you can explain why you reject that. And, and what, what, in your definition, is zero tolerance? I think the, the phrase zero tolerance, I think it means different p things to different yeah. people when we're thinking about education. But if I can kind of flip, the, flip my, my response to this idea of young people being a product of their environment. Young people are grown up with role models and they will actually mirror the things that they've seen. And so 
our responsibility and our job as adults, because we've seen a lot more, is to, to help them and to nurture them, to be able to get to a point of, and the, the example I give, and we don't do it well as adults, I don't think, is this idea to be able to agree to disagree. As adults, it's absolutely fine to do that. We can agree to disagree. What we've got to learn to do better is get to a point of understanding, which is to say, actually, I can hear what you're saying and I can see where it fits, but actually this is what I fit, but actually I've got a new appreciation from what you've said. And I think that's just a skill in itself. And so when I think about young people and how we've got to develop them to move forward actually that's the mindset that you want to do so for me it's about separating out the behavior which is a product of upbringing versus how what am I going to do as an adult to help you develop your thinking and so this idea of you do something wrong zero tolerance and off you go doesn't sit easy with me what sits better with me is actually you've made a mistake, let's talk about it, let's reason it, and you might do it for the remaining 180 days, but that's probably how long it's going to take to change the behaviour. Behaviours don't change overnight. Um, I think it was Drucker, wasn't it, who said um, if you measure something, you can then manage it. You can then manage it. Um, but in a place like this, in a school, there's something called culture. Yeah. How do you measure culture? How, how did you know? Okay, so your KPs are improving, so there's more people, more staff staying here. Yeah. Your financial health is getting better. Does that indicate the culture is getting better? Or so? How, how did you measure the soft a bit? How did you know you were on track, other than through the sort of hard, specific KPIs? How did you yeah. know? And, and did the kids? Could you tell anything from the kids? Yeah, I think when you when you think about our attendance, and I think I've put that down as one of our. KPIs. I mean, just the attendance in terms of we've been top of our network in terms of pupil attendance for the past three years. We're, we're, we're kind of at the top of the league table and we've got 38 schools in our network. We've got 20 plus secondary schools. So the attendance, but then it's the interaction with your stakeholders, which is the real teller for you as well. Um, you know, Dan, myself and my vice principal, my senior vice principal, who's now been promoted to head of head of school, we used to have what was called the Friday meetings. So every morning with parents, coffee, your morning eight till ten no appointment needed you just come in and you um open door policy almost. open door policy open you door. come in speak come in. speak to leaders so you go from a kind of packed hall and having to absorb and bite your tongue a lot because there's a lot of anger coming to you to then getting to two years later where you've genuinely got um, a family that's just walked by because they've just dropped off younger siblings and just want to come in and tell you what a good job you're doing and have coffee with you. So I think that over the two years is definitely what we saw, but it was the consistency. And that is a lot harder to achieve than the actual greater plan in itself. It's how you stay consistent because it becomes easy, doesn't it, to say, right, I'm not going to do that Friday or something else has become more important or actually this meeting is where I need to be. But if you're actually absolutely firm as to why you're holding that meeting in the first place and what the purpose is, you then don't deviate from it. So for me, consistency was absolutely key. And like I said, we went from a hall full, lots of anger, you're not doing this right, to the numbers dropping, the comments get nicer, actually we'll just pop in because it's a nice place to be. So that's also a measure of, of so, culture. So that was an open star management, in yeah, other words, it open door, come and see us anytime, we have nothing to hide yeah. and we'll confront anything that comes. Absolutely, and, and what we have to remember about our parents, and there was many anecdotes that I, I could give you on this, but they just want the best education for their children. And there was a lot of frustration that had been built, built up. And actually, the frustration isn't at us. We just arrived. But the frustration is around what's happened previously and them hearing the same thing again, but what we then have to do to move, move them forward. So parents needed to have an outlet. We needed to be able to absorb that. It goes back to the resilience and connecting with our eyes and then reassure parents as to how we were going to move forward. But then we had to deliver on that. Now, st staff retention, um, any organisation, school, college, university, um, any private sector depends on its people. Yeah. So how did you, how did you get it from 32% to 90, I mean, that's extraordinary, 97%. Yep. 
Was that simply throwing money at them? What was it? How, how did you manage to get people to stay? Was it money? Was it something else? What, what was it? What, what, what kept them? It, 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 was, it was a combination of things. I think in, in the early days, it was a lot around uh, recruitment and retention, which is what you'd expect to get people through the door. And that definitely has to happen. That's got to be part of the plan. It's never just one thing. But, I, but I've got two, two phrases, actually, which are public statements when I talk to the staff. And number one is that with their permission, we're going to love and we're going to hug them. The hug being the one that we need permission for. But the second one is around if in three to five years we haven't developed you to go on to your next promotion or we haven't developed you in a way that gives back to the sector or developed you to take on your promotion to another school, obviously we'd love to keep you, then actually we failed you as an organisation. Um, and that's, abs that's absolutely key because that relationship has to work both ways. What are we absolutely showing that we are able to give you to make you better in the role that you can do so you can serve children? And sometimes I think we need to pay more attention to what we can give to, give to our people. And we won't get it right all of the times. There's always initiatives that go wrong. But for me, broadly, it's been those two things that... Actually, I would like to think if you walked around the school, the staff would tell you how much we love them. And the second thing that they would be able to articulate is this idea of three to five years, they would be able to step up um, and do something. We hope in this organisation, otherwise serve children. And it's in those children that get a better deal as a result of it. So interesting. It wasn't the money. It was a sense of direction, a yeah. sense of personal development. Uh, and they knew that, you know, that they would be better at yeah. the five years than... Absolutely. And there, it was really interesting because there was a Deloitte survey that came out about two years ago, which, which really got me, actually, because when we think about the millennial cohort coming through now and what drives millennials, we actually think about, and it's really interesting, one of the stark findings from that um, research was this idea that millennials are really mission driven but they're not really that they are interested in the finances, but the mission meant more to them than the financial incentive. And that was absolutely key, and you'll be familiar with that report, I know. But that then made me think about, well, as an organisation or at a school level, what does that need to look like in our recruitment, in our marketing, in terms of what we can actually um, what we can actually offer. But I thought that was a really stark financing and we now have to start thinking about how our plan has that flex to be able to accommodate that because actually if it's not the finances and our mission isn't strong enough, then how are we going to get the new cohort in to kind of take over the mantle as it was? Um, now part of, your, um, part of your reporting structure is that you have to work with the Board of Governors or yes. school. Local government um, body, yes. And and how did you find all of that? Um, because now you had to account to someone as well as your network. Yeah. Um, was that easy? Was was it was that was that difficult? Was it different skill set you required? One of influencing. I think, in terms of our local governing body, I think they're in the same situation in that they've. These are volunteers who give freely of their time and they're here because they want to make the school the, the school better and the input that we get from all of the different stakeholders in terms of points of view if you're able to use that in the right way is so insightful it just extends your leadership team by a hundred percent so this idea of having to give them reassurance it it upskills you in your reporting lines in and the information that you're providing but what it absolutely does is when governance is excellent and I will say this governance has always been excellent here they will hold you to an account in such a way that when you leave that room you are driven to want to do more for your kids and so yes they demand a lot from us and that's right they ask a lot from us and that's right but I think when you walk out that door you're wanting to do more as a leader in your school. Now let's, let's just um, home in on the leadership skills and traits so as you were going through your career, did you get management training or leadership training? Because what you tend to find is that people who excel in sales or operations just get promoted because they're good at yeah. that. But that doesn't necessarily make them good at managing people and seeing yeah. the big picture. Yeah. So did you, get, did you get that sort of training or did you learn it as you, as you go along? Did you have formal leadership training? So. I think there was two parts to my training, but if I was able to go back 15 years and if there was a key message I was going to say to anybody coming into education or any organisation, 
the, the thing that I would be screaming about is coaching and mentoring being a planned programme into somebody's development irrespective of their role. And I was very lucky to have two mentors where actually part of that role needs to just be tell me how to do it. What's the base model? What, what's the minimum expectation about me being able to manage people well? I.e. this idea of being able to have these regular meetings, make sure that you have gone into that meeting um, with intention, you know what you want to ask. It's not just meetings for meeting's sake. So this idea of scripting meetings and being intentional, um, being taught that to have a calendar and a rhythm is absolutely key, making sure that that calendar and rhythm didn't um, make sure that people in your organisation were overloaded because they're part of one structure and another structure and both things are coming together. So that was a straight, I was able to learn that as part of a mentoring programme. The coaching was probably the wake up um, piece for me and I was really lucky when I joined the organisation that there was a coach that I could go to but if you can get people to have a heightened sense of understanding about their own behaviours and then be able to talk about how they are going to address the behaviours moving forward you take ownership of your decisions and so what I would be saying is some things will happen by chance some things will happen because you've got a hell of a lot of potential but if you can formalise that potential, I think the impact that it will have on others in your team will just be fantastic. Would you refer to a, a book as being quite instrumental? Yeah. Um, Radical Candor. Radical Candor. So yeah. perhaps for those who don't know, very quickly, what is that? And which bit did you pick and why? Yeah, so, so Radical Candor was given to me actually by my regional director in 2017. And it was really about, so Kim Scott, she's um, an American author. She's a business person, very influential in her field. She coaches some of the top CEOs in um, FTSE 100 companies. And she talked about how we become more candid around the table. And that was really interesting for me, but how you can be open and direct, but care for your people at the same time. And so a lot of that language I picked up from her. And what was really interesting, and you know, if people get the opportunity to have a look at that, and it's in the article, but this idea of sometimes you can be really insincere with your people, because you as a leader haven't got the skills to be able to have a direct conversation. So inadvertently, in the moment, you might think you've cared for that person, but actually you've set them back. So this idea of being candid and what that looks like and how it promotes a healthy um, culture within your organisation was a real turning point for me in my leadership, definitely. Do you read a lot? I always go back to it. Like, it's, you know, when you have that kind of handful of books that you always flip in and out to, that's definitely one that sits on my bedside. And, and you still read I, a, a lot of books? Yeah, or? I still read it now. So oh. the one that I've just finished reading is an excellent book by Sir David Carter, who was the National Schools Commissioner, um, has wrote a brilliant book on why trusts um, succeed. And it's just a great book on everything there is to do with leadership, during his time um, in, in, in the sector and, and he's just a great person to read and that's not limited to education there's a lot of case studies that can be used across different sectors in that. Um, do you think leaders, you know, you've worked for a few and you've had those reporting to you, do you think leaders are, are born or do you think you can train them to become leaders? I, I, would, I would want to say, Linda, I think Everybody has got the capability to be a leader, and you're going to say that's a diplomatic answer, but let, let me kind of um, put that between this idea of, I think that because of the sector that I'm in, I look at 900 kids in front of me and I believe that they're all born leaders. It's our job to make sure that we nurture those skills and we make sure that we nurture those skills because that is our future generations. And I think there is a lot of different meanings around what it means to be a leader. And I don't think society functions with any one type. And that's probably the message that I would want to stamp. You need the leader that can quietly sit in the background because that in itself is leadership, but then push others forward. At times, an organisation demands a bold leader at the front so you feel safe and secure. And sometimes you need that bold leader to be able to step back and let other leaders come through because to be able to extend that trust is really hard. So I think all of us have 
um, and are born with the skills to be able to do that. It's just how we nurture them through. And that's why education is so important. Okay, now, now it's just sort of moving away from sort of the leadership style. Let's now just connect up finally. Um, schools, skills and industry. Yeah. Um, employers will now tell you, uh, and they tell me all the time, that they can't get the skills, yeah. skilled people they want. Um, you're probably closer to this than most of us. The next generation have a different lens yep. to the ones we see. Uh, too often industries say schools are driven by tick box or by hitting certain KPIs, yep. as opposed to an emphasis on soft skills. Yep. Um, they say that potentially, maybe, maybe not, but maybe the advent of social media and technology meant, has meant that kids now learn in a different way yeah. and they communicate in a different way. So, so a couple of things then. So are the schools failing industry? Uh, are the, uh, have the schools been inflexible in changing their teaching methods? Are schools inflexible in not recognizing that people learn in different ways? What's your answer to all these sort of challenges that people pose at schools? Because that's where, that's where from say yeah. five to 16, yeah. that's when you can mold someone yeah. and mold them in the right direction. And, and finally, this may not be something you can answer, but careers advice, maybe it's not what it used to be. Yeah. So anyway, it's a lot of questions. I was gonna say, and they're excellent questions. Let me just stamp that point. They are excellent questions. And so I'm, I, I, I want to try and give you um, a question that brings with it some clarity. I think there has been, we've had several reviews that have taken place, haven't we, with in terms of the skills and what we're obviously providing the sector and all of those things. I think what, what I would say in the moment is this, that actually I think when we think about the way that young people learn and we think about them being our future generation and what they have to take forward. And I think the Deloitte study is where my thinking in this time is being drawn from. And there's a lot more research that will follow. I think actually organisations have got a part to play in terms of stepping up and being able to articulate with absolute clarity what their mission is and what they are here to do. Because actually the incoming generation need to hear that more and more. I think skills can be taught. I think organisations need to step up around what does the development programme look like? Because I think we have to, in part, I would hope that we would have to accept that we want kids to learn. We need them to find the time to develop their skills, find their skills, see what suits them, what they can dip in and out of. We no longer are in a generation where you go on one path and it's fixed. So for me, it's all about the softer skills and this idea to be able to adapt is absolutely key. But I do think that this is a issue that's currently hitting schools because that's where, where what industry is telling us. But the question, if I may, um, put to industry is this, how strong are you on your missioning, how strong are you articulating the clarity of your purpose and what you're here to do, and ultimately how are you going to love and hug the next generation coming in in terms of making them better so they can do better for your organisation? That's a challenge. If we'll that's fair. Them. If that's um, fair. Now, let's just moving finally now on to COVID. Um, how have you coped? How, have schools coped? How, have you had to change your leadership style? Have you had to be flexible? Have you had to think at the box? I mean, that's quite a difficult situation yeah. with lockdowns and losing education. And yeah, it, and, and it's been really tough and we don't always get the opportunity and you won't um, stop me from just making this really point, which is just a heads up to all like organisations and especially leadership, because the way that leaders and schools have just stepped up has been absolutely phenomenal. I think you've seen the sector collaborate in a way that it hasn't for a long time. I think the sharing of practice that has happened between academies, local authorities and free schools has just been commendable. I think this idea of being able to pull upon one another for expertise, you know, I think it's been a long time since we've seen that level of collaboration that, that's happened. And that's absolutely key to any organisation moving forward. So for us, the job has been tough but it's been a lot easier because of those relationships in the sector and us being able to pull upon them in terms of um, 
plugging the gap as far as possible. I think the big steep curve that has happened is getting us as educationalists onto the tech side of things. You've got schools that do it really, really well and they're integrated into Google Classrooms and it's just tremendous. And I think if I'm speaking about Bolton, it's the single most thing that I know when we get to September, we can never go back to how it used to be. And tech will always be there in a sustainable and integrated way, which is just, I know how that's gonna springboard us now into the next five years. So change. Change. Change is there. Yeah, change, change has happened. COVID has changed that. COVID has changed us for the better. Uh, just, just before we uh, sort of finish this, um, just picking up again on the kids' side and leadership and everything, uh, there's, there's a school of thought which says it's all about habits. It's all about instituting the right habits yeah. um, around the softer skills and making sure people... Is that the case? Is leadership easier if people have good habits? And, and is that one of the reasons why you were able to cope with COVID? Because you had some good structures in place. People were used to doing things in a right yeah. way and so they had the right habits. Is, is that... I, I, think, I think that's fair. I think your culture is everything. But if I may reference back to this idea of the plan yeah. and the plan holding enough flex to be able to withstand things that necessarily were not planned, I think that's absolutely key. But I think culture is built over time and we can't bypass that. We have to invest lots and lots in that. So if we're saying to the organisation, like I had to say to my teachers, we're now going to get these lessons ready to be able to put online so our children have got something to access to learn upon, that only happens when you've got a strong enough culture where teachers just go above and beyond. And that's not limited to education. Culture is something that's got to sit as the core strategy within any organisation. And I think that's the cement that keeps everything together. So finally, back to KPIs. Yes. Because you're going to be far too modest. So I'm going to remind you what you've done. So pupil role was 816 and falling. Falling yeah. numbers, number of customers coming in. It was reducing, yep. Uh, you're now oversubscribed. Yes. Um, first choice applications, which was a mere 41 out of 180 spaces. You're now 151. Yep. Uh, you've got 97% staff retention. retention. And you have a surplus as opposed to a deficit. So congratulations on that, and congratulations on getting an OBE. Thank you. In recognition of that. Thank so you. well done on that. So I suppose the next question now is, um, you had a plan, you've exceeded the plan, you've rolled out your five years, you've turned it completely around. This is a complete turnaround, the quarter round turnaround specialists. Where does it now leave you? What does the future look for you? Uh, I, I, I would say a, lot, a lot's a lot been learnt and I think for me moving forward it's, it's how you can tell the story. I think one of the things that we don't do well is tell the story and I think the opportunity to tell the story because this won't be the first school or the first organisation that needs to um, um, turning round but I think what we have to get better at is sharing the story and telling the story and being able to support leaders on their journey in the story so I think one thing for me as a takeaway would be is any organization when you look at your people coming in as in no matter what the role is make sure we've got a program to support them to develop to help them get through the dark days to help them on that journey that's big so for me it's about influence is the next thing and how you can do that well but i think to be able to tell the story to show that it can be done is absolutely key and none of that will ever happen without your team and stakeholders with you because unless you take them on that journey with you unfortunately um, the, you know, the organisation in itself becomes the limiting factor. It is your stakeholders, no matter who they are. You know, those are the people that you are accountable to, and that's absolutely right. And that's why it's key to have the right stakeholders. But they are the things that will kind of push you forward. As I was driving in, I think it's one twenty-five. I've seen an exodus of kids just leaving. So yes. my guess is quiet at the moment. So my guess is you've shot early around one thirty on a Friday. Is that typical? Yeah, so or were you frightened of us coming in? No, 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 not at all. I hope that it was a calm and orderly exodus, by the way. They were very, very well behaved, actually. Good. So, um, 
Ninda, if I think back to when I talked about an organisation's responsibility to their people and how they're going to develop them, time is the most precious commodity that we have. And so we wanted to make sure that we could build in our staff training in a place where it wasn't disrupted, because staff training isn't something that you do if you have time. Staff training has to be something that's built into the organisational strategy. So... Um, Talking to, obviously, Arcas and Matt, obviously with the OK from the governors, we decided that on a 1.30 on a Friday, that would be dedicated to staff training. And that can only be done if the children are not on site. So our children leave um, on Friday. We've got clubs and things that are happening with external um, providers. But it means that staff can then, free of mind, plan their lessons for the following week, engage in CPD, train themselves up on things that they have got an interest in, work together as a team um, to support anything that's on the agenda. But they're able to do that not having to think about anything else. And so when I think about retention and how we got there, that I know heavily played a part because we've got to look after people along the way as well. And to have that meeting at five o'clock in the evening, that's that's not okay. Do you reckon you'd oversubscribe because all the kids know they can get away on a Friday? Oh, no, no. So be behave, behaviour is too strong and, and our children know they have to come back here on a Monday and, as well. And, 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 and Stakeholder-wise, were the parents comfortable? Were the parents comfortable with that? So what the parents are comfortable with is the offer that the children get um, arts clubs and you know I'd love to invite you in and we will definitely invite you into our arts fest but the art the music the drama the sports that runs after school that broad range of, of things is just is just really strong and by the way before I forget one of my complaints uh, about the education system is that they don't focus on those subjects the arts the yeah. sports and Absolutely, and this is why I would love to have you back um, in the summer if we're able to, but for the past three years, one of the things that really helped to win our parents around was the Arts Fest, and it's a celebration of art, music and drama from our GCSE children and our younger children. There's auction, there's music, there's food, it's community coming together, it's a wonderful atmosphere. And can I say... Um the cup of tea and the biscuits have been wonderful. So. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed them. The hospitality would have been a lot more had we not been in COVID, but I hope they've been enjoyed. Uh, listen, thank you very much. No, uh, it's been a very interesting discussion. Thank you. Much to have learned and much we've picked up. And uh, I wish you the best for the remainder of your career. Thank no, you very thank much. Thank you. Thank you for being with us, Linda. Thank, thank you. you.